The World Beyond the Headlines Lecture Series is a project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies. Thank you, Denise, and welcome, everyone, to this evening's event. The University of Chicago welcomes the open and frank expression of opinions on all manner of subjects, as long as they are based in factual information and free of emotionalism or bias. We understand that on many contentious issues, opinions and interpretations may differ dramatically from one person to another. We take no official position on any issue, but we insist on the right of all speakers to be heard without disruption, just as we stand by the right of members of the audience to pose questions to the speaker following his or her talk, as long as those questions are also fact-based. Providing a place for the free and unfettered exchange of differing views is the fundamental goal of the university, but it can only be realized if everyone, speakers and audience alike, conduct themselves in a civil, dignified, and respectful manner, notwithstanding sometimes sharp differences of opinion. Anyone, therefore, whom the staff deems to be engaging in uncivil or disruptive behavior may be asked to leave, and if necessary, will be escorted from the room. So thank you very much for your consideration. I hope you'll enjoy this presentation. And now it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Amos Giora, uh, who is a member of the faculty at the Professor of Law at the S.J. Quinney College of Law of the University of Utah. He teaches a wide variety of courses on criminal procedure, international law, global perspectives on counterterrorism, and religion and terrorism. He's also uh, a, research, a research associate uh, with the Oxford Institute of Ethics, Law, and Armed Conflict at Oxford University in England. Uh, he's a member of the American Bar Association's Law and National Security Advisory Committee. He's a research fellow at the International Institute on Counterterrorism at the Interdisciplinary City, uh, Center in Herzliya, Israel. And he's a corresponding member of the Netherlands School of Human Rights Research. He's written a number of books. Uh, his recent books include Global Perspectives on Counterterrorism, appeared in 2007, Fundamentals of Counterterrorism, 2008, Constitutional Limits on Coercive Interrogation, 2008, Freedom of Religion, Rights and National Security in 2013, and Homeland Security, What Is It and Where Are We Going in 2011. That's a, an enviable record of publications. I know I, I don't keep up with it. So it's a great honor to have him here tonight. Uh, he'll be addressing us on the subject of legitimate target, a criteria-based approach to targeted killing. Please uh, join me in welcoming Emis Giora. Good evening. Can you all hear me in the back? So when I think about this issue of target killing or here in the United States what is referred to as drone policy, obviously the questions are innumerable. They are also, not only are they innumerable, they are complicated, complex, and they pose extraordinary dilemmas to the decision maker and the public alike. But before getting into the issue itself, there's an, a larger question, let's call it an uber question, that needs to be answered. And that is, how does the nation state conduct lawful, moral, and effective counterterrorism? I would suggest that in terms of discussing targeted killing, the drone policy, it's absolutely essential that we ask ourselves, what is it that the nation state is seeking to do? And against whom is the nation state seeking to um, combat or com conduct counterterrorism? And to what end? To answer any of those questions, Fred, we could be here until you know, next week, but, or longer. But question number one is, what is the obligation, what is the duty of the nation state? to its civilians, and please note, I use the word civilians and not citizens and non-citizens, but very deliberately use the word civilians. And I would suggest the following. The overarching, overriding responsibility of the nation state is to protect its citizens, civilians. 
but, and the but here is critical, I would say that, that the answer to protect its civilians is not at an all-costs paradigm, not by all means necessary, because lawful counterterrorism implies the following, that there must be limits on state power. Rearticulated, the state cannot do everything it would like to do in the name of protecting its civilians, that there has to be limits imposed on the state. One of the difficult questions is who's going to impose those limits on the state? Is it going to be imposed by the executive branch itself? Is it going to be imposed by the legislature, the Congress? Is it going to be imposed by the judiciary? Will it be imposed by the public? Will it be imposed by the media? I think if we reflect back and also think forward, reflective and forward. I think one of the great questions is whether or not nation states have effectively engaged in what I refer to as self-imposed restraints. We'll circle back to that. In addition, however, to the question of the rule of law, which is obviously essential to this discussion, because there can't be no effective counterterrorism without being predicated on the rule of law, I would suggest there's a second branch to this conversation, and that is morality in armed conflict. If 20 years ago, Fred and his colleagues would have invited somebody to speak about this issue, safe to assume that morality in armed conflict would not have been addressed. It is a new vector in this conversation. And I would suggest it's absolutely essential that we address this question of morality in armed conflict, and what exactly does morality mean? Morality slash ethics. And the third leg essential to this conversation is what I call effectiveness in counterterrorism. And how do we define effectiveness, and what is it that we're seeking to do? But let's work our way backwards and ask ourselves, who is going to impose these restraints on the executive predicated and provided that we agree that there must be limits imposed on the executive. So I stand before you and suggest that what was referred to by Justice Jackson in one of the most important Supreme Court decisions, Youngstown, Sheet and Tube in the 1950s, the fear of the unfettered executive suggests that we have no choice but to impose limits. Now, let's begin asking how we're going to impose those limits. Here in the United States, if you go back from 2001 until today, I think it's fair to assume that the following institutions have largely failed to impose limits. One, the Congress. Two, the judiciary. Three, the public. And four, the media, to break that down. By example, I remind all of us that in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, the Bush administration established military commissions to try suspected terrorists. At the first congressional hearings before the U.S. Judiciary, the Senate Judiciary Committee, it was clear that members of Congress had not been consulted by the administration whatsoever. This was what is referred to as a clear example of the unitary executive devoid of congressional oversight. It was so bad that the then chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Pat Leahy, whether sarcastically or not is unclear, asked um, then Attorney General Ashcroft if he, Ashcroft, knew how he, Leahy, chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, had heard about the military commissions. Ashcroft said no. Leahy said, thank God my wife has a subscription to the, New York, to the Washington Post. And I suggest that in the name of congressional oversight, if that's the role of Congress, that if the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee has to thank his wife for having a, a subscription to the Washington Post, that means that Congress is not playing an active role in oversight of the executive. That's point one. Point two, the judiciary. So if one reviews really carefully, and I suggest you all take time to really carefully 
read a line of Supreme Court cases, U.S. Supreme Court cases, in the aftermath of 9-11, Hamdi, Hamdan, Rasul, Padilla, and Abu Median, you will see that by and large, the Supreme Court failed to engage in what I refer to as rigorous, vigorous, and robust judicial review of the executive. The significance of that is that the executive branch, again, in the context of being unfettered, unfettered. Point three, the public. Well, if you look carefully at public opinion polls in the aftermath of terrorist attacks, it's pretty clear that the public wants, public wants one thing and one thing only, and that's a hard, if not a harsh, response to terrorism. And frankly, from the perspective of the public, the consequences be damned in terms of people on the other side, or the supposed other side, who are injured. The role of the executive is to discard, not to be distracted by that noise. And the fourth venture in all this is obviously the media. And one of the great questions, which is well worth studying, is does the media feed into that need, or does the media act as a restrainer on the executive? And I would suggest, while the jury is out, that by and large, the role of the media is not to act as a restrainer on the executive, but is largely feeds into the noise in the aftermath of a terrorist attack. So, full circle, the paradigm that we largely, largely have is an executive branch unfettered in terms of oversight and review from external agencies, external bodies. And in the American paradigm, I remind all of us that the Constitution of the United States is predicated on separation of powers and checks and balances. So one of the profound philosophical legal questions that we need to ask ourselves is whether or not separation of powers and checks and balances is indeed in effect in the United States in the context of terrorism. And I think it's fair to assume, again, the jury is arguably out, but fair to assume that the answer largely is that checks and balances, separation of powers, has not come into play in the context of terrorism. Case in point. I bring to your attention the following. Two weeks ago, Wednesday, that's well, 12 days ago, you can find, download this from the internet, the Department of Justice white paper articulating the Obama administration's drone policy was leaked and, as I say, is now downloadable. What it suggests is the following paradigm, that imminence in terms of threat posed is extraordinarily broadly defined, that there need be no specific evidence of an act about to occur, and that an immediate threat not be identified. And yet, according to the white paper, an American and non-American citizen, if he or she, gender neutral, is perceived, identified, defined, to be a senior operational leader of Al-Qaeda, is defined now as posing an imminent threat, but imminence broadly defined, as short as my hair is, or as long as my hair is, that person is now a legitimate target. Let's do this again, because this is absolutely essential to this discussion. According to the white paper, there need not be specific evidence of an imminent attack in order for somebody to be, quote unquote, droneable. In the context of the rule of law, morality, and effectiveness, I would suggest that this DOJ white paper, which I warmly recommend all of you read, 16 pages long, it'll take you a few minutes, creates a deeply troubling paradigm in the context of the magical question, who is a legitimate target and when is that person a legitimate target? And in many ways, I bring to your attention and suggest humbly that the DOJ white paper is as troubling as the Bybee memo was that was articulated and created by the Bush administration in the aftermath of 9-11. I remind all of us that the Bybee memo created the Bush administration torture interrogation paradigm. The two documents, Bybee memo, DOJ white paper, 
in essence, say the following, to cut it short. Unfettered executive, unlimited executive power, by all means necessary, legal definitions this broad, devoid of overview and oversight. Troubling indeed. Go back to what I said to you at the very beginning, that the role of the, of the executive is to protect you from identified bad people. But also remember what I said to you, that that power is not an absolute and this notion of by all means necessary, you know, those great Harrison Ford movies. That paradigm cannot and must not work in the context of operational counterterrorism. Full stop. So in the name of candor, I wear for this conversation two hats, no hair. Hat one, obviously, is that of an academic, as you graciously mentioned in your introduction. And hat two is that I spent 20 years of my life in serving in the Israel Defense Forces where I was involved in the legal and policy aspects of operational counterterrorism. One of the questions that I was confronted with while serving was what are indeed the limits of state power and what is the role of the rule of law? In addressing this question, the following I would suggest are essential to having this conversation. One, it goes without saying that the paradigm in terms of the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians is obviously enormously complicated, deeply complex, and hopefully one day resolvable. And in that vein, I need to add that from 1994 to 1999, I was deeply involved in the implementation of the Oslo peace process because I happen to deeply believe in peace. On the other hand, as former Prime Minister Rabin, assassinated by a Jewish terrorist, said, we will fight for peace like there is no terrorism, and we will fight terrorism like there is no peace. And I would suggest in the context of operational counterterrorism, that articulation by Rabin I think better than anything else manifests and articulates the extraordinarily com extraordinary complexity of counterterrorism in an almost impossible paradigm. To that end, I wrote an article a number of years ago describing this as mission impossible, because that is what it is. And before I get into the details, I want to make it clear that I'm speaking to you not ephemerally nor abstractly, but from the perspective of someone who has been involved in the decision-making process. The following are the critical questions. One, how do we define legitimate target? How do we determine when a target is indeed legitimate? Three, how do we apply four critical international law principles? The four principles are the following. Proportionality, collateral damage, alternatives, and military necessity. Again, and I want to emphasize very clearly, while those principles may sound abstract to you, if you believe in counterterrorism subject to the rule of law, those four principles must be applied at all times. But then obviously I need to make a caveat in the name of full disclosure also. One of the realities, unfortunately, of operational counterterrorism is yes, mistakes are made. Yes, there is collateral damage. That needs to be clearly stated. So we have those four international law principles. In addition to that, and as I started to say earlier, we also have this exceptionally problematic and maybe undefinable thing called morality in armed conflict. So there's a long debate amongst military commanders as to whether or not A, morality can be imposed on soldiers, 
and B, whether or not morality can be taught to soldiers. In the IDF, in response to innumerable complaints by various NGOs and um, human rights organizations over the course of years with respect particularly to the conduct of soldiers at checkpoints, and some of the complaints, yes, justified, others not so justified, we reached the following conclusion. We said we absolutely must teach soldiers how to conduct themselves morally with respect to a civilian population. Is it easy? Of course not. Is it a perfect solution? Of course not. Is it necessary? Yes. Third point, effectiveness. So one of the great questions in the context of targeted killing drone policy, not only what are the short-term ramifications of deciding to kill somebody, but what are the long-term implications and ramifications of killing that particular individual? And on that, I would suggest the following. There is not consensus as to the long-term impact, and I'll explain in a second why, though there's largely consensus as to the short-term impact. And the distinction between the two is absolutely essential to understanding target killing. What's the difference? So if we are sitting in this lovely room, and there's a report from an intelligence source that somebody is planning on coming into this building and going to blow it up, to engage in preventive self-defense and to kill him or her before they blow up this room, I would suggest in the name of lawful self-defense, Article 51, United Nations Charter, it's fine. But it's more complicated than that, and it's more complicated than that for the following reasons. By example, to make a suicide bombing attack occur, please note and please remember for the following few minutes, there are four distinct actors involved, if not five, to make a suicide bombing occur. And here's who they are. Actor number one is the person who's going to blow himself up or herself up, the bomber. Actor number two is the person responsible for logistics, you know, making the suicide bell, driving the person to the site. Person number three is the financier of terrorism. Much like intelligence gathering is essential to counterterrorism, financiers in many ways are the engine that drive terrorism. Actor number four, we'll call him the quarterback of the team, the person responsible for the cell, the person who drafts people, recruits people, identifies the targets and so on. And perhaps the fifth, and on this the literature is unclear, is a person who creates the environment whereby terrorism is possible. But we'll put him aside because I'm not convinced that that exists. But we have four clear actors, all four essential for suicide bombing to occur. They all four are legitimate targets in the context of self-defense is articulated, again, Article 51 UN Charter. But the larger question, the harder question, is when are they legitimate targets? And that goes in many ways to the heart and soul of targeted killing drone policy. So I would say the bomber, the person who's going to blow us all up here, he's a legitimate target when he's out there about to come in. Is he a legitimate target when he wakes up and he thinks about maybe yes, maybe no? The answer is no. He is not. Because he's not gone beyond that threshold where he indeed has taken that step, which is that step of irreversibility, or at least from our perspective where it's too late to prevent an act of terrorism, and he at that point is a legitimate target. Unless, of course, he is detainable. Because frankly speaking, from the perspective of counterterrorism and intelligence gathering, far preferable to detain rather than to kill, obviously. But unfortunately, that occurs. Some people are undetainable, and there are obviously instances where it is just operationally impossible to detain somebody, and then the dilemma from the perspective of the decision makers, how do you, in the context of lawfulness, prevent an act of terrorism if the guy is out there, and if there's no alternative other than to kill him, that he, at that point, is indeed a legitimate target. Category number two. The person responsible for logistics. So what he's, you know, at home talking to wife and kids, is he a legitimate target? No. Because he's not engaged. And this is the critical question, maybe the uber question, 
when does the person become a direct participant? If you go back to what I cited from the Department of Justice white paper, one of the things that, at least from my perspective, is so deeply troubling is the direct participant is so broadly defined like this in the context of imminence that at any point, regardless if you're directly involved or not, you're a legitimate target. That's what's so troubling. However, in the context of limited self-defense, which is what I'm talking about here, what I'm proposing is a theory, the person responsible for logistics, when he's making the belt, if he's not detainable, is he a legitimate target? Yes, indeed. When he's driving our guy, if he's not detainable, he is. Because we're crossing that threshold. Person number three, the financier. So five years ago, the financier was not a part of this conversation. Why? Because. Today, it's clear to those of us who are engaged in the business of counterterrorism and thinking about counterterrorism that much attention needs to be given to, to the role of the financier and as to when the financier is a legitimate target. And on this, the literature is very much divided. To wire money, to do the enter, all of you who you know, deal with money knows it takes about half a second, just wired. So the question is, when, in addition to that second, is the financier a legitimate target? And I turn to the young people in the room and I'll say, anybody who wants to write on this, it's low-hanging fruit. Frankly, none of us have a great answer on this one. It is, however, a critical question, particularly as the role of the financier becomes increasingly clear. There are various theories out there. Is he 24-7 a, a, a legitimate target? I think not. Is he only when he's doing the wiring? I think not. He's somewhere in the middle. But note the difficulty with that very phrase of somewhere in the middle. If you take the DOJ white paper and you apply it to the financier, he's a legitimate target all the time. And I suggest that's a paradigm that's illegal and immoral. Where exactly does he fall on the spectrum? I don't think, and I, you know, to be, frank, to be perfectly candid with you, I don't know. Somewhere in the middle, where? Open to discussion. And the fourth actor is the quarterback of the team. And the quarterback of the team is the quarterback of the team. I told you earlier, he recruits people, he drafts people, he identifies the target, he trains them. I mean, you know, the quarterback is the quarterback is the quarterback. He's a legitimate target 24-7, regardless of what he's doing. But, and the but's important. If you're going to engage in target killing on a 24-7 on a, you know, principle, go back to my four-point international law principles. Absolutely have to make every effort to minimize collateral damage. So it's not enough to say that the quarterback is legitimate 24-7. The obligation, responsibility of the nation state is to do so in such a way that minimizes collateral damage. But. International law does not impose on the nation state the obligation to have no collateral damage. It imposes on the nation state the obligation to have minimal collateral damage. What does minimal mean? You know, one of the things international law does not do is it does not, you know, it's not an empirical process. It doesn't quantify. What's minimal? You know, litmus test. But minimal is minimal. But no collateral damage is not an obligation in the context of collateral damage. So what does that then mean with respect to targeted killing, to move the ball along? When I was involved in targeted killing decision making while serving as, particularly as the legal advisor of the Gaza Strip, from my perspective, the following was essential. Maybe the most important. That each decision be subjected or subject, subjected, subject? to a rational based checklist intended to enhance objectivity and to minimize subjectivity. And the point of a checklist is exactly that, a checklist which you just run through a checklist because if you don't have a strong, powerful checklist in play, then again in legalese, the idea of strict scrutiny won't exist. By example, when I would receive you know, a phone call, there were a series of questions that I had prepared for the commander intended to ensure that the person identified by the source was indeed that person. What's essential, more than essential, 
is the idea of a process in place. And the role of a process, the purpose of a process, the philosophical point of a process is to, as much as possible, to minimize the God-awful making the wrong decision. In the context, not only of law, absolutely in the context of morality, and at the end of the day, no less important, this idea of effectiveness. So if I could draw, which I can't, I would draw a triangle for you. Law, morality, and effectiveness. The only way to think about, at least I suggest, the only way to think about targeted killing is to have this triangle in place 24 hours a day, seven days a week, predicated on the following. One, clear, narrow definition of threat. Two, not only articulating that someone is a legitimate target, but when are they a legitimate target? Three, a narrow, uber narrow def definition of imminent and imminence. Because if you have a broad definition of imminence, then the consequences are clear. Four, speaking truth to the public. And here's the truth to the public. We will never defeat terrorism the best we can hope to do is to manage terrorism, minimize terrorism. We will never defeat terrorism. And precisely because we will never defeat terrorism, the state can't do everything it would like to do. And when I think about drones targeted killing, I suggest to you the following. It is the warfare of the future. And we have no choice as a society, as a public, those of you who come out on a Monday night, but to address this question, because the reality is the following. It's clear that from the perspective of whichever administration, the idea is to minimize the boots on the ground. It's not by chance that President Obama recently announced there'll be 34,000 troops left in Afghanistan. What it really means is that drones, drones, drones. There are, according to various blogs out there, Drones, drone attacks occurring in at least seven, if not eight, countries on a regular basis. Meaning, re-articulated, the U.S. is conducting drone attacks in seven, if not eight countries. Does that raise questions about sovereignty? Of course it does. Does it raise questions about limits of power? Of course it does. Does it raise questions about effectiveness? Of course it does. But what I suggest to all of you, humbly, is that all of us need to ask ourselves the following questions. One, what's being done in our collective and individual names? What are the consequences of violating sovereignty of places like Pakistan, which we are doing? What's the significance of having this policy in play in which imminence is this broad? What's the significance of not having the executive branch subject to review? No congressional oversight, no judicial review. And at the end of the day, What's the significance of significant collateral damage? Is that going to result in increased and enhanced terrorism coming from the other side? There are studies on this, and I want to bring to your attention an important study, maybe the most important study on this very question, conducted by, by my very good friend, Professor Ed Kaplan, who's Professor of Operations Research at Yale, in which he shows compellingly that High collateral damage in the context of targeted killing drone policy leads to an increase in terrorism. That's why I told you earlier, you must, or at least I suggest you must, think about targeted killing from two distinct perspectives, short term, long term. Kaplan's research shows that long term, particularly if there's high collateral damage, there's an uptick in terrorism. And then we get into this, you know, the, the term that we all love, cycle of violence. On the other hand, on the other hand, on the other hand, if there's a terrorist standing outside this building and there's no means other than to kill him to prevent all of you from being killed, I would suggest that the overwhelming majority, never say everybody, but the overwhelming majority of you in the name of self-defense would agree to kill him. Never say everybody. And that, in many ways, articulates and manifests the extraordinary complexity of the targeted killing paradigm. 
Final word before we turn it over for questions. I cannot emphasize enough to you, strongly enough to you, this, from my perspective, this triangle, legality, morality, and effectiveness. But the only way to understand that triangle, with all the criticisms, with all the controversy, is that the terms must be narrowly defined and strictly applied. And I say that to you because the reality is in 2013, drones today, drones tomorrow, I don't know if drones forever, but drones are going to be the wave of future. Technology has its allure. How we implement that, how we apply that, is a challenge that all of you must engage in. There are, trust me, no easy answers. It is not controversy free. Discussion is important because we all have a responsibility to ask ourselves what, again, is being done in our names to protect ourselves. And finally, finally, what are the limits of legitimate and lawful self-defense? Thank you very much. Our speaker will answer questions, so please come to the microphone and uh, get yourselves heard. In light, of the, uh, in light of the relative effectiveness of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, what is your view on a drone court, either in the executive or the judicial branch? Yeah, I think that's a great question. That's obviously, sir, become um, a hot topic in the, in the last uh, – couple of weeks post-release of, of the DOJ paper. Um, I think it's essential. Whether it's going to be the FISA court or some kind of an um, external tribunal, I, I don't think anybody has a clear answer to that, but I, I think that the answer is that it, it's clear that we need that, particularly if the DOJ white paper articulates represents Obama administration policy, then there has to be some kind of oversight review. Um, FISA court is convenient because it already exists. Um, easy to convene. I mean, the, they know the logistics of it. They know the, you know, the workings of it. And that may well be um, the way to go. I would just add one more word on that, sir. Um, oh, I think it was like five, six years ago, I wrote an article recommending that the FISA court become the drone court. Um, I was obviously heavily criticized for it then. And then one of the suggestions was to create like an, like an uber tribunal of experienced former, you know, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defenses, but not subservient to the President of the United States, but acting perhaps on behalf of Congress. Not sure about that. I think at the end of the day, it would be a FISA court as part of the, you know, the national judiciary. My name's Adam. Thanks for coming in. Um, you brought up the issue of targeted killings of civilians, and you asked us, when are they legitimate targets? You said we need to make sure to minimize collateral damage. Correct. Okay. And then it is better to detain if possible. Correct. Right. Correct. So how does targeted killings of military or government personnel play into this? For example, 2006 with Hezbollah picking out and deciding to detain IDF soldiers instead of kill them. Right. Tied to that, you, Wait, well, you talked about... Well, one one question at a time. I'm not that smart. <laughs> well, I think uh, you are. You did a pretty good job <laughs> explaining your view. So, But go ahead. Um, soldiers, if a soldier is killed, it's not an act of terrorism. Gilad Shalit, for instance, right, um, and I speak to you as someone whose children serve in the IDF. Um, terrorist attacks are, are tar target um, innocent civilians. Soldiers are not innocent civilians, and if a soldier is killed, from my perspective, it's not an act of terrorism. The kidnapping of soldiers, like Gilad Shalit, um, you know, soldiers are in harm's way, are in harm's way. Um, where Hamas, I think, was beyond, beyond, was, so was the Red Cross, was, was denying Red Cross visits, and, and, I mean, that obviously violates international law. But I think it's important to distinguish between soldiers who are in harm's way as sent by the state and civilians. And again, I say that to you, sir, as someone whose children serve in the IDF. So your argument then could be applied to these groups that we in the United States, our government, as well as the Israeli government and other governments in the country, in the world, that claim that these terrorist groups then, their actions are terrorists, but then we could actually, from your argument, claim that then Hezbollah, Hamas, etc., 
are actually providing the same tactics, using the same tactics that you're arguing that we use. No, because them. Hezbollah, Hez, Hezbollah clearly are, um, attacks innocent civilians. I don't see. I'm, no, 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 no. I did not say innocent civilians. I talked about military targets. Oh, if they're attacking military targets, then it's the, it is a. That I would not say is terrorism. I would say that, from their perspective, is engaging a military. But hang on. When Hezbollah deliberately targets innocent civilians like they did in 2006 in northern Israel, that is terrorism. Which then you would apply to Israeli government when they attack civilians in No, I would say Lebanon. no. So there's, there's the issue. There. Right, I understand that. I understand that. Um, the question is, again, in the context of self-defense, I don't think Hezbollah is acting in self-defense. But you see where your argument is... There's a fallacy in your argument. No, we're going to because disagree. Respectfully disagree. you talk disagree. about morality, and mm -hmm. you talk, and I'm, I'm just, you wanted to open this up to debate. Mm -hmm, sure. So let's open up to debate. Then it's the same thing with the U.S. government going in and targeting innocent civilians that then we claim are military targets. Well, you just brought up that point and how the white paper that was just brought right, up by the, the Obama white, administration. That again, the question in, is. And how do we define that? So the issue comes down to it seems within your argument is that it's okay when it's the government deciding how it's defined no. versus another non-state organization. That's no, what it seems. No, I think that, the, okay. Oh, the government, government has the right to engage in self-defense according to international law. The question is how you apply the principles of self-defense. Just maybe to follow up on a couple of the points that he made. The other idea that's very vague in my mind is the whole definition of what's a terrorist. It seems like everybody has different ideas of what a terrorist is. You think some folks in the Palestinian side are terrorists, they think Israelis are terrorists. Very, very bad in terms of the definition, very, very broad. But what I'd like to really think about is a, is a specific example widely reported about uh, the Israelis when they killed an Iranian nuclear scientist. Uh, if you think about it in terms of terrorists, he's a civilian, is, would you consider him a terrorist? Would you consider the threat eminent? In terms of all of the standards that you're talking about, in terms of a rule of law, how can you apply that on a case like that when it seems to me really right. just, really just, for, just, just pursuing a policy idea uh, through, 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 through killing people? Right. So, uh, and answer the question with respect to the Iranian scientists, again, I just like you read the newspapers, I think the litmus, the litmus test with respect to Iranian scientists based on the media reports, because I think that's what I know about it. If it's an Iranian scientist who's engaged, involved um, in creating the Iranian nuclear program, then I think he loses his civilian status and wears a different hat. But the question is going to depend on his role in the creating of the Iranian nuclear reactor program, because the Iranians have been very clear that the point of the nuclear reactor program is to destroy Israel. And if you're deep, hang on, let me answer. And if you're deeply involved in that, then your status is not exactly as a civilian. You're playing a significant role, if indeed your role is significant, in participating in something that has the ability to endanger the state. In the context of self-defense, not everybody, never say everybody, I think most people, I don't know, X percentage of people would agree that in the context of self-defense, legitimate, obviously not everybody's going to agree with that. And again, this, this can get into the subjectivity of what you're talking about, because a lot of people would not view him as a civilian. And, 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 and Iran, itse Iran itself says this is not for bombs, this is for other purposes. You right. disagree but when the with president it. of Iran makes but, it very but, clear that the purpose of the Iranian nuclear program is to destroy the state of Israel, then I would suggest that those involved in making that bomb are not wearing a civilian hat, are wearing some other hat. Are they wearing a military hat? No. Are they wearing a hat that, imp that has the ability to endanger the state? I think in that context, again, in the context of Article 51 of the UN Charter, probably falls within that. It, it gets so muddy in terms of what self-defense, what are all these other things are. Right. It really just seems like, it, it, at the end, what the lawyers are doing is justifying the policies that the government wants to take. I've heard, I've heard it a definition of criterion-based killing slightly different from yours, that it's not uh, that there's specific intelligence that a specific named person is a logistics or financier or quarterback right. and so on, but that there are criteria by which somebody or a group of people look like they fall into one of these categories. And um, in the same discussion, I heard someone was alleging that uh, the, 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 the statistics uh, show collateral damage is declining. And I'm wondering, one, first, whether uh, that is a, 
uh, a definition of criterion-based killing used in practice that is uh, kind of indices of someone being a terrorist, and two are the statistics uh, to give feedback on collateral damage based on the same methodology, which of course suggests that the, the method might be totally screwy. And then kind of a, related to this, a broader question, um, uh, I submit that a lot of this turn to targeted killing is because of the public's unwillingness to engage in more arduous um, methods of addressing causes of terrorism like nation building or building functioning economies. And so, so the real moral and policy question is uh, maybe the public should uh, be prepared to engage in these more serious uh, long-term solutions. So you asked a number of great questions there, sir. I mean, uh, you could write, have a whole different lecture on, on, the, on the gentleman's question. Um, I think probably the most important point, sir, you made at the end, which is indeed that the public needs to engage in this conversation with the understanding, absolutely, that we're not all going to agree, but having a discussion, sir, I think is absolutely essential. Hi, Ms. How you doing? How you doing? Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, this is obviously a very contentious issue. Uh, just as a way of background, if I might, very briefly, I'm retired. I was in the uh, a senior executive of the Booz Allen Hamilton in their mm. aerospace and defense practice with a uh, secret security clearance in the Pentagon. I have 10,000 hours as an airline transport pilot. I wrote a text on aviation policy, which is a text you wrote Northwestern. A text on? I'm sorry? You said you wrote a text on? I didn't know what you it's said. It's at Northwestern University in their business school and law school ah. on aviation policy. I testified to the U.S. Senate on drone policy and retired now. Um, you're obviously an Israeli. I'm you're, dual you're citizen. You're a dual citizen. Right. So you have your own particular views on what a terrorist is and how a drone would be used. Um, there's clearly uh, an argument for uh, the presence of terrorists in many different locales, including your home country, which, by the way, the Obama administration just ranked Israel as among the top 30 terrorist states in the world. And I wonder, uh, question one, would drones be used? And by the way, a drone, and there's, those are used, that's a, a subject used very loosely. I'm an expert in drones. I'd happy to be, talk to you about what a drone is. Uh, but uh, uh, would one be used legitimately against an Israeli terrorist? That's question one. Uh, since uh, many other I'll organizations. I'll answer you right on the spot. In 1990. March, nine, March 90 or 91, I don't remember. There was a terrible act of terrorism committed by a, by a Jew, Ami Popil, in which he killed eight Palestinians in, um, oh God, in Rishon Etzion. And there was significant discussion as to whether or not the same sanctions imposed against Palestinians should be imposed against him. And I voted yes. Voted yes as, in what capacity? In, at legal advisor. Legal advisor to whom? To the commander. Commander, who, what commander? As an Israeli soldier? Yeah, sure. So you're here as an Israeli tonight no, no, or an American? No, 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 Hang on. Slow down. Wait. I'm answering you honestly that when serving in the IDF, when a terrorist attack was committed by a Jew, I recommended the same sanctions that are imposed against Palestinians be imposed against him. Uh, right, here's my other question. Is that the, the, the drone is really not a weapon of, of attacking insurgents. It's a terrorist tool. Drones terrorize civilians. Drones do not kill insurgents. 90% of the effect of a drone's use is in killing civilians. Mm -hmm. If the drone were so effective, and I certainly understand the dynamic between your country, i.e. Israel, and Persia, then you should use the drone to kill the Ayatollah. Instead of using it to terrorize civilians, I see in the picture tonight, there's a picture of a drone flying over a mountainous terrain, obviously in the middle of the Middle East somewhere. I don't see it flying over North Korea, a far bigger threat to the United States than, than many other countries. I don't see it flying over, the, over cities where the actual senior political officials who are in charge of actual terrorist organizations and their, uh, their actions are used. It's used to terrorize civilians. It's a, it's a civilian terrorist tool. Do you disagree with that? No, I read the same reports that you do, sir. That, what uh, reports do you read? 
I'm no, think seriously. You have, we have to limit ourselves to questions and not op totally. We have a lot of other people who want to have All questions right. too. So. Well, anyway, I appreciate you being here tonight. It's obviously you're an Israeli special interest asset presenting a particular point of view of an Israeli, not an American. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Michael Nance. Yes, I'm Dale Nance's son. Hi. Oh, how are you? Good. How are you, sir? Fine, thank you. How's your dad? He's fine, thanks. He says hi. Um, my question tonight is, um, what do you think has been Israel's finest and worst moments in terms of morality, in terms of its security dealings with the Palestinians? I think the, the dark moment <clears throat> was the targeted killing of a guy named Shada. <clears throat> Shada was, um, I remind all of us, Shada was the uh, Palestinian who was responsible for the planned attack. I don't know how many of you have been to Israel. When you fly into Tel Aviv, there are three towers, our version of the World Trade Center. He was going to, he was responsible for blowing the plan to blow those up. He was killed in a target killing, conducted from my perspective poorly, because there were 16 innocent people killed in that target killing. I think that the Shada attack is, I think most of us would agree was, you know, the, the unsuccessful moment, clearly. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, I think, if you will, a shining moment, I don't know if there are shining moments in counterterrorism, I would say perhaps the shining moment, if there is one in counterterrorism, um, our decisions by the Israeli Supreme Court in which it, the court sitting as the High Court of Justice clearly lays down to the executive branch the limits of executive power in the context of counterterrorism. And I think that that's true with respect to the target killing policy and particularly interrogations. And I think that if there's one thing that, that the world can learn from Israel, and I, I come back to what I said about the DOJ white paper, is the role and the benefit of a robust judiciary. I think that is Israel's, maybe Israel's most important contribution. Um, it had come out that um, the U.S. Um, said it was lawful to target American citizens and foreign That's citizens. That's the DOJ white paper. Right. Um, I was just wondering if the U.S., if there's any policy on what if um, a foreign country was targeting their citizens on U.S. soil, mm -hmm. and if there's um, a way to curb that, or if they ever thought about the repercussions of them using our policies against us. Yeah, there are people here whose memory will be far better than mine. If I recall correctly, and if I'm wrong, correct me. In the late 70s, there were Chilean activists who were targeted by the Chilean government here in the United States. So the answer is, where'd you go? The answer is, in the late 70s, early 80s, there was one, if not two, if I, could, if I remember my history, you, know, you can Google this, um, who were targeted by the Pinochet government in Washington, D.C., Yeah, you know, how do we say it? Your guess is as good as mine. Hi, um, I have a more specific question. I was wondering if there's a limit to the number of people who can justifiably be killed as collateral. Wait, wait, say that again? I was wondering if there's a limit to the number of people who can be justifiably killed as collateral. No, damage. international law is pretty murky in this one. It says that the responsibility of the nation state is to have minimal, <laughs> to minimize, whatever the word minimize means, it's not clearly defined. But wouldn't that mean that at some point the table will turn and we become the terrorists? Wait, wait, hang on. I, say that second part again. Well, because I'm talking about collateral damage. Right. These are, these are like people. They're innocent civilians. Totally. Basically. You know, they're totally. Not, we're not talking about like killing. Yeah. You know, oh, absolutely. Soldier, agree. Killing soldier. We're talking about like, you know, accidentally killing yeah. civilians. Correct. So at some point, if, you know, the number, there's no limit on the numbers, then I don't know. What's 4,700 is the limit right now that they're saying is how many people have been killed by drone attacks? There's a report that just came out last week. I think that was 4,700. So like at some point, there's going to be more people killed by, you know, these attempts to keep us safe. That so, I agree with you, and that's why I, of, I agree with you, and that's why I, I, I recommended looking at the research of Professor Kaplan, because he looks exactly at the significance, A, of collateral damage, and what it results to in terms of what you're suggesting here. And that's why there are, from I, um, Mr. Nance's question about, um, where I think Israel made a clear mistake with, with Shada, the killing of 16 innocent, the, 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 the target killing of Shada, we can agree, disagree, I think it was legitimate. Killing 16 innocent, resulting in the deaths of 16 innocent people, I think that was clearly a mistake. Hi, I'm, I'm Jeremy. Uh, I have a can you pu push the mic up, mic up a bit so I can hear you? I'm Jeremy. 
Uh, I have a two-part question. Please. Um, first part is, how would you compare, uh, like, a drone strike to a conventional, like, commando raid? Uh, drone meaning, like, the aircraft. Right. And, yeah. Um, the second part is, how would you compare a uh, counter-terrorism uh, operations to conventional police operations? Mm. <sighs> Let's take, a, uh, by example, the bin Laden raid. As far as we can tell, right? As far as we can tell. And if I'm misstating, you'll correct me. The bin Laden raid resulted in the death of bin Laden with zero collateral damage. The drone attacks, as, as we, it's been pretty made clear by statistics, has higher collateral damage. From the perspective of decision makers, the advantage of the drone is you minimize, not absolutely, minimize boots on the ground. It's more sterile from the perspective of the state. Boots on the ground implies potentially higher danger both to soldiers and to intended targets and the collateral damage, right? Because firefights can happen. The idea from the perspective of the state is to, again, minimize boots on the ground. I think that's going, that's why I said to you earlier that drones today, drones tomorrow. Um, Operate special forces, um, you know, the literature is not unanimous or um, not, not unanimous as to whether or not they're always effective as compared to drones. But again, you have to look at it in terms of collateral damage. With respect to called special forces law enforcement, right? The question there you ask is a great question, which is a much larger question. And that is, do we view terrorism as law enforcement? Do we view terrorism as a military action? Or do we view it as somewhere in the middle? And the truth of the matter is that 12 years after 9-11, um, I don't think that here in the United States we have conclusively and coherently articulated what it is. Um, here on domestic soil, we would probably say law enforcement. But at some point, it may morph into something else. Internationally, we don't view it as law enforcement. We view it as clearly you know, counterterrorism, but not war, because war is only between states. Your question is a great question. The answer is not absolutely clear. It's a little bit murky-ish, for which I apologize. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, uh, my question is actually a slightly similar to his, and it's, uh, do you not think that the part of the triangle is morality, that uh, our soldiers are morally obligated to take on greater risk in order to minimize collateral damage if raids like the one on the Bin Laden compound have less collateral damage than a drone strike? Yeah, I think that because the danger in the drones, the, the danger with drones, particularly because the joystick guy is so far removed from the actual zone of combat, that's particularly why I think that morality must be a part of it. With, with, by the way, with the murkiness of morality. Right. right. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Francisco. I come from Buenos Aires, Argentina. And uh, I think that most people here are because we are in trying to envision a more peaceful world. And I'm glad that I'm here and hear the arguments as to uh, how do we justify the things that we do. Uh, in Argentina, in 1935, the United States and England conspired to kill a senator on the Senate floor because they were trying to protect the interests of the meat companies, exporting companies. Now, if you read uh, Eduardo Galeano's The Open Veins of Latin America, you will see that that exploitation is continuing and if that is not terrorism against these people, I don't know what it is. And when people uh, reacted in certain ways, then they were called terrorists, and then the CIA and uh, our government uh, send uh, killers there to suppress the unions or, you know, as, as a matter of fact, there are uh, documents that they were revealed <coughs> recently that uh, as, uh, an ambassador to Argentina from the United States asked the State Department to help to protect some of the workers there. They were, mm -hmm. they were being murdered uh, by our own CIA. So uh, how do you uh, envision a more peaceful world, and uh, how do we change this uh, 
this uh, way of, 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 of killing each other in a, in a, 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 by means of uh, exploiting, abusing, uh, a, a, a continually extracting the, the blood and, and, the, and the life of people all over the world. I think, sir, you ask a great question. You know, I agree with you. If I guess if I had the answer, um, I don't know if I would get the Nobel Peace Prize, sir, but I think you ask, you ask a terrific question. And I, I mean, I look at, you know, let's call it the state of the world today. And I agree with you, sir, if we look back in history, and you're right to highlight, you know, South America. And I remind you, sir, that Executive Order 12.333, um, implemented by the Ford administration and renewed subsequently by every American administration, comes out of the Church Committee, and the Church Committee looked at the policy and the actions of the CIA in Latin America over the, you know, the course of decades. Um, we could go on and on. I think, I'm sure, sir, that you and I share the same concern about, you know, at the end of the day, having a, a more stable and safe world for our, our children, right? Um, you know, it's hard to leave me speechless, sir. I'm going to agree with you 100%. But the hell if I know how the hell to make that happen. Uh, my questions are related to um, trying to draw some kind of historical comparison or, or precedent from um, the drone strikes. And uh, one thing that I found interesting was uh, uh, sort of the implications of President Obama being so hands-on with the attacks and mm -hmm. making these... Um, the know, calls himself? Right, exactly. Um, and, and I was trying to, you know, I was thinking of like Lyndon Johnson in Vietnam and picking Barman target, targets and mm -hmm. uh, arguments early on over uh, whether... Uh, the president or generals would uh, be able to authorize nuclear, uh, tactical nuclear attacks. Um, and also uh, the idea that these, these systems are in play before there's a formalized um, uh, structure in place and whether, uh, you know, the, the government will catch up with that. And, and, you know, I'll let you answer. Well, you asked a great question. First of all, I'm not sure there's a system in place. Um, first of all, I... If I recall my history correct, if I'm wrong, correct me. Truman himself makes a decision about the bomb. Yes. I mean, that's presidential. We can agree, disagree about dropping it on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but it was the President of the United States. Well, by the way, I remind all of us that when Truman replaces FDR, he didn't even know the damn thing existed, right? He wasn't in on the secrets. And historians still debate why he decided to do it. Right. But it's Truman who decides what he decides, right? Um, We've all seen the pictures of, of an anguished LBJ night in, night out in the Situation Room and, you know, as President of the United States. Um, is he directly making the calls? I don't know. But is he sitting in the Situation Room every goddamn middle of the night? I mean, right? Um, the pictures of, of President Obama there huddled around the TV screen as um, bin Laden is killed, I think it's, it would be impossible but correct me if I'm wrong, for a president to be involved in each and every decision with respect to a targeted killing drone. I just, I think it's, he needs to delegate. But if the delegation or if the principle in play is predicated on the DOJ white paper, then I would suggest to you respectfully that there is no system in play. There is something ad hoc-ish. Um, and that goes back to this gentleman's question about the need for congressional oversight and or some kind of judicial review because the DOJ white paper, which is as of the moment, is the document of record, you know, there it is, right? That's not a system and it's not a process. It's, it's a DOJ white paper, by the way, unsigned by its authors. 16 pages articulates the policy. Off we go, Americans and non-Americans alike. Um, devoid of oversight, review, whichever, right? Um, and if, I would like to think that the president is probably delegating this to somebody, but I have no idea, speaking to you very frankly, having been involved in these kinds of things, I have no idea what the hell the criteria are, what the criteria are, because criteria need to be narrowly defined. And I think, is it, can the president make every decision? No. Is it reasonable to delegate? Yes. Must that delegation be subject to oversight and review? Absolutely. That's a system. Thanks. Uh, we have to end around 8 o'clock, so I'll close the line at this point for questioners. The three people in the line now will be allowed to question. So the gentleman in the plaid shirt will be the last question from the floor. Thank you. Hi, my name is Noah. Um, so I, I heard you say that uh, we'll never be able to defeat, defeat terrorism. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I, I, from what I heard you say, I thought you made a strong case that uh, what's called counterterrorism will never defeat terrorism. Mm -hmm. So why would you not turn towards nonviolent means? Right. I need to make a great question. Point no. There are two different strains to to counterterrorism. And I was remiss in not mentioning that. And I thank you. One strain is what I call operational counterterrorism, which is what we're talking about here. There's a different vector, a different strain, and that's what I would refer to as soft counterterrorism. Building schools, building hospitals, economic, re re economic re restructuring, and so on. The two need to work hand in hand. Um, and I'm remiss in not having mentioned that, and you're right to mention that. Um, ideally, ideally, the soft counterterrorism hospitals, schools will have an effective role. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just, uh, you know, I, I was in the West Bank. I, I worked side by side with Palestinians. It wasn't soft counterterrorism. Mm. It was treating each other as human beings. You can't do that with an armed occupation here or abroad, and you cannot do that with drones or soldiers. It won't work. You're right. You will never defeat terrorism. This is more a curiosity question. Um, pretty soon the United Arab Emirates will be getting uh, the Predator drones unarmed. How do you feel about that and what's to prevent those drones from becoming armed? You know, if it's, if it's a reality, it's a reality. And if they become armed, they become armed. <laughs> Sir, last question of the night. Uh, I want to ask one. Oh, you're going to ask one. I get the last question. That's yeah. quite all right. Sir, go ahead. Take the pressure off. Um, I, I'm going to go back to the question of imminence um, and apply them to uh, the four and potentially five roles that you brought up to get the bomber. Uh, the five guys, six, right. Yeah, five four, guys. maybe five. Four, maybe five would be a particularly interesting, interesting question about the fifth. Right. Um, there's a concept within international humanitarian law of a continuous combat function. And so when your concerns about what does imminence mean, they don't necessarily, there doesn't necessarily need to be a uh, plot, if you will, um, but if we are engaging in a war against Al-Qaeda as authorized under the authorized use of military force in 2001, how would you apply potentially this continuing combat function to those four positions and then... Would not. Would not. Would not. Would not. Could, could, you, could you enlighten us as to uh, why you don't think that's an appropriate... Because, the, because it's too broad of a definition. So I'll uh, exercise the privilege of the moderator and ask a final question before thanking our speaker. Uh, this is obviously an incredibly contentious issue, and the whole question of drones, to me anyway, is a very troubling one, the idea that you know someone in Kansas has breakfast with his family, sends his kids off to school, and then goes to some warehouse somewhere and watches a screen and pushes a button and kills someone in the Yemen or Pakistan. It's quite horrifying. Um, so the question in my mind is, would it be possible, and I mean, drones maybe the wave of the future, more and more countries will obviously get them. And as the young woman suggested, you know, what would it be like if all of a sudden there were Chinese drones taking out Chinese dissidents in Chicago, and maybe a few Americans too, as collateral damage. How would we react to that? So the question in my mind is, do you think it might be possible for there to be an international convention banning the use of drones, as we have with poison gas, for example, and working on it for, working on it for landmines? Um, it would be some, obviously countries would still have drones, as countries still have poison gas, but they can't really use it, except in the most extreme circumstances usually. And so that would maybe improve the matter a little bit. Just, the, the, just I agree with you. I mean, just like there are other um, international law, international regulations in context of treaties limiting warfare, will we come to that with drones? Perhaps. Um, it just seems like. Pandora's box to start using right. drones more and more. Absolutely, particularly, and you make a great point. And with the, uh, the problem of collateral damage and the blowback, as uh, Mr. Kaplan talks about in his book, you know, the, the, uh, the long-term consequences are so grave, they, they seem to sort of undermine the very purpose for which you are tempted to use the drone. So maybe that would be an incentive to get rid of them entirely. Except, of course, it still used them for surveillance. Oh. But uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about ones that can fire missiles and you know do bodily harm. Could be, you know. Well, we won't know. 
uh, obviously a very a fascinating topic. Uh, and I thank you all for your questions, and let us thank our speaker for enlightening us on this issue. The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is a project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies. Our nationally recognized programming is made possible with support from the Norman Waite Harris Memorial Fund. Download recordings of other events and learn more about the World Beyond the Headlines series at the Center for International Studies website, cis.uchicago.edu.